So, Birdo, the new TV show on HBO called The Flight Attendant, out of 10, what do you give it? I give it uh, an 8. Wow. You liked it a lot more than I did. I gave it a 6. I'd give the first half a solid 7, maybe an 8, but the last half I didn't like. But let's get into that today. We're going to talk about the psychology of the show first, and then we'll get into our opinions of how the show went. So, there's lots to say about the psychology of this show. And whenever I'm looking at psychological depictions of therapy or conditions, I'm always looking for the following things. I'm looking for accuracy. Did the show accurately depict a psychological condition or what therapy looks like? Is it stigmatizing? Does it help the plot? Or is it just used as a cheap way of moving the plot forward? So Mm -hmm. let's get into it here. Let's talk about what did we see? What did you see, Berto, in terms of psychology in this show? Let's talk about that first. Okay. Um, and spoiler alert, right? Because we're yeah, gonna... yeah, we're gonna spoil the whole whole thing. Yeah. Spoil, spoil. Yeah. Well, I mean, the um, the show does something where at first I thought they were gonna do in a superficial way, but they essentially present what was a childhood extremely traumatic not only an extremely traumatic event which was the uh tragic car crash where her father dies because they're drink he's drinking and he's giving her drinks and then he crashes but also really the lead up to that which was a lot of abuse inflicted by her father to both herself and and his kid his son um uh emotional mental abuse at least and maybe some physical abuse towards the son and so like all this uh, presented where she had completely different <laughs> memories, or at least she told herself she did. And yet it, it sort of defined her personality and her uh, reactions to trauma, to m- present day trauma that was happening to her and present day emergencies. Uh, and so that was really interesting because they, they were basically showing us her discover it was almost like she was in therapy the the length of the series was her in therapy slowly discovering why was she, why she was being so chaotic okay well let's talk about those two elements first in terms of there's a a lot of other psychological elements but let's talk about what you just brought up which is childhood trauma and repressed memories let's talk about the childhood trauma first so what did we see in the show in terms of childhood trauma so the the net seems to be if we are to believe the final version of events is that her dad was um, very disappointed with his uh, son, who was her older brother, because he felt he was effeminate and because he didn't think he was man enough or whatever. So he would regularly berate him and minimize him and put him down and sometimes hit him. Uh, Meanwhile, he seemed to put her on a pedestal he seemed to like idolize her and really it was all about her. But at the same time, he would, you know, give her beer and she was, you know, little, she was like 11 or something, uh, giving her a beer and taking her hunting and shooting deer and all these things. Um, and like, so he, he would spend a lot of time and energy with her and almost none with his son. Uh, and then this, this kind of set her on a path. Uh, So we saw that. And then we also saw that essentially she ran away from the death of her father because she didn't want, uh, she didn't want everyone to know that it was what she thought was her fault that he died. Right. Yeah. So, and just to put a fine point on what you said there at the end is that she witnessed the death of her father and the death of two innocent people. Her father was driving drunk with her while she was drinking and her father ran into another car and killed two other people and killing himself. And then she saw, witnessed that whole thing and was hurt herself. And yeah. I I actually didn't catch that the other two died. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, uh, yeah, that's what we saw. Now, Birdo, can you relate to this at all in terms of childhood trauma and what it feels like to be mistreated when you're young. Yeah, definitely. So not to the extreme of the show's uh, events, but yeah, so like when I was a kid, uh, and I think everyone does this, I had an illusion about what my life was and how I related to everyone around me. 
And part of that illusion was I was the center of the universe. Everyone really loved me. Everyone cared for me. Everything was really like nice and safe. And uh, so when I first went to therapy, because I had had an unexplained panic attack, uh, I was talking to the therapist and she asked me, so if there was one word that you would use to describe your, your life up until now or in general, what would it be? And I said, happy. That was my word. She thought, oh, that's so nice, you know. Uh, but, you know, as we started really peeling back layers and, and really kind of talking through what was happening to me in my life at the time, I, I started realizing, I'm like, wait a minute. Why do I have such a happy version of events of everything that happened to me as a kid? Like some major trauma happened to me in a lot of different ways. My mom left when I was very little. Uh, I, I suffered some sexual abuse. I was, um, I had to move, relocate completely multiple times. You witnessed your leaving. parents being violent. You witnessed. I, I, I witnessed violence in the home. I witnessed yeah. uh, deception. I witnessed dysfunction in my. Once I was living in a what seemed to be a stable home, and it was actually a very dysfunctional household. It turns out uh, because there was, uh, you know, my my dad was living there without employment and he would always have arguments and fights with my grandma and then my my grandpa's health was in complete decline and anyways the point is i had a version of events in my mind that was out of defense really cherry picking these these beautiful pieces of it and there were those aren't invented there wasn't complete fabrications but they were suppressing all this like bad stuff. What, what were some of the key happy moments that you focused on? I don't know if I've heard this before. Well, so the people that went, that I was around, my grandma, my grandma's sister, my dad, my uncles, my aunts, every time I, I thought of like, how were my interactions with these people? Like, I remember feeling warm, like, oh man, it's like, Umbertico. and like, there's always like this happiness to see me and there was always something that someone would do for me that was nice. They would yeah. take me somewhere or something nice would happen. What about the sexual abuse you went through? Did you see that in a positive light as well? Yeah, definitely. Up, up until I was uh, in my early 20s, certainly as a teenager, I, it was conflicted in my head because part of it, I thought of like something cool. Like, oh, you know, I had been lit in, let in on the club early and... Um, Definitely, I thought of it like, certainly when I was a kid and I was five and it was happening, I thought of it as like, I was in the know. Just like she felt about her dad giving her the alcohol. She's like, yeah, I'm in the club. Right. You know, this is cool. This is, I felt like that too. I was like, oh, I'm in the club. This is all cool. And it was not till much later. The first thing that happened is that when I was 12, which by the way, uh, 12, five to 12 is seven years. Uh, to me, that felt like a lifetime, like, you know, a whole movie had played out because uh, when you're a kid, seven years is, is an eternity. Yeah. That's your life, you know? Yeah. But anyways, I was 12 and I was at a party and I saw my abuser who was now 18. And I remember in my mind, I was thinking, oh, I know what you did. And I felt a little bit of an empowerment, but I, I didn't confront her. I just, just thought, I know what you did. But at the same time, I was feeling that ambivalence of like, but maybe I'm still feeling like I'm in a cool club. And then years and years later, when I was trying to describe this to a friend in college, like my first, no, like second year of college maybe, I remember that's when it first started really hitting me that maybe my story wasn't quite what I thought. Because I was like presenting it to, to him as like, oh yeah, dude, this crazy thing happened to me when I was like five and blah, blah. And I was telling it and his reaction was not what I was expecting. Like, cool. It was like, oh, really? I'm sorry that happened or something, you know, something along those lines. And I thought, wait, this is weird. Like maybe, maybe that was really not okay. Yeah. That's pretty close to what Cassie was going through in the movie. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty similar because she had this version of her past that was all rosy and nice and that her dad was the fun-loving guy and the brother kind of would make a fool out of himself. But then as we learn through, as the show progresses that 
the dad was just flat out a drunk and yep. ab- an abusive. Well, the two of them, the 11 year old yeah. daughter and the dad both were intoxicated and would abuse the son and the mom and the son weren't party poopers. They were the normal ones in the yeah. family, the victims of the two of them. So, yeah. I, I also had the experience of thinking that because, you know, I was made to feel like I was the center of the universe by my dad and my grandparents. Um, I think everyone was both. I was an only child in that household, but also I think they were compensating for, oh, you know, he, he lost, his mom left. And so I was really meant to feel like the center of the universe. And the thing is, I didn't realize that I, that caused some pain to others because I would sometimes act like it and demand too much or expect too much or be too, you know, be a brat in some ways. Um, I remember the first time I, that reality hit me across the face was I was at my grandma Liti's house, who, whom you've met and whose house you've been at. And I was walking up the steps and I overheard the, their maid was talking to her in her room. And I heard her saying something like, he's just impossible. He's so demanding and blah, blah. She was complaining about me. And I didn't finish going up the steps. I kind of froze. I was like, what? And I was like, what is going on? Um, and it was one of those moments where I, I didn't really process it, but years later, I'm like, oh man, I must have been hard to deal with for her. So I was probably like, you know, the little God emperor of the household when I was visiting my grandma. Hmm. And it's like, get me this, get me that, who knows, you know, like, um, and then I remember my cousin, one of my cousins would tell me just like, I, I didn't, she didn't tell me this directly, but what I, the implication I felt was that she felt like always like second a little bit because there's so much attention that was given to me that she would feel like, you know, she wasn't as important or something. And I was like, whoa. And this happened to me, this, this realization happened to me with multiple different cases where I was like, oh man. So the price for me being made to feel like I was the center of the universe is other people would feel like they weren't and they weren't even close to the center. And of course, I, you know, I was just a kid. I'm just like, whatever, you know. Well, and they were trying to haphazardly make up for the abuse yes. that you had gone through right. and the neglect. And so uh, it was a, probably a good result. I mean, would they yeah. rather have a, a little child emperor with a <laughs> broken heart or would they rather have a lonely, broken hearted kid who you barely pay attention to, right. you know, like, yeah. So, it's, so they probably did, the, probably did the right thing in, in some ways. Um, all right. So let's talk about, uh, the show here. Uh, so childhood trauma, you, you, you described it well and relate to it in a very specific way. And so the question to me is, is it accurate? And I would say that, yes, it's very accurate. The way that childhood trauma was discussed and, and laid out, especially the feeling responsible part and the way that the the way that she drank to suppress the trauma. It's very, very common. Uh, Whenever I see someone who struggles with ongoing substance abuse, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, alcohol, it's usually because when their trauma is triggered, whether or not they have full-blown PTSD or not, they'll have a spike in distress or feelings, and they will not know how to deal with it because they've never been allowed to talk about it and they find just randomly that when they use substances, it goes away. So that was, that was very accurate. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a more poignant, maybe Goodwill hunting when, uh, the, when Sean says to Matt Damon, you know, Robin Williams system, Matt Damon, it's not your fault. You know, it's, it's not your fault that your dad beat you. It's, It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And it was similar to that in that it, it feels and I get chills just thinking about it. it. The the way in which in the show, the flight attendant, when as an adult, she's just like, but it was my fault. Yeah. And Alex is saying, no, <laughs> it wasn't your fault. And this happens. Uh, perfectly rational, intelligent people, whether they're kids or adults, will completely retain that idea that they're to blame for the whole thing. And there, we could have different explanations for it, but this is a real phenomenon that happens to all of us. When we go through situations, particularly when you're young, we, we tend to see the world revolving around us. And when something happens 
good or bad, we attribute it to us. And yeah. because we don't have the brain power, the experience to expand beyond, you know, for 11 year old to go like, well, my dad has traumas and he has this problem with alcoholism and he doesn't know how to deal with his feelings. And so that's why he drinks. And that's why he buddies up with me because he needs a drinking buddy <laughs> and, and I'm 11. And so I don't know what's going on because I'm a child and you know, no, there's no <laughs> conceptualization. It's just like, yeah. I drank with my dad and I encouraged him to drink and he encouraged me to drink and he got in a car accident and died and killed two people. I'm, a, I'm at least partially to blame for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that notion just becomes encoded in your body and then you're 35 years old and you just assume, yeah, wouldn't anyone consider this to be my fault, right? That moment when she is in her mind palace, <laughs> she goes into these big, very vivid hallucinations. <laughs> but when she's in there and she tells her little self, that it's not her fault. Uh, that gave me chills. That's that moment you're you're saying. Like it's it was like wow. Imagine because that's what you're trying to get in therapy. Like you're trying to talk to your little self yeah. and be like, hey, let's work through this together. You know. But then she got to metaphorically, or I guess maybe <laughs> through actual psychoses to actually be able to do it. Like she she was able to talk to her little self. Yeah, we'll get into the psychosis in a second. That scene reminded me of the Elton John movie that came out not too long ago. Oh, yeah. In which he, uh, the, the sort of climax of the movie is when he actually interacts with his child self. Yeah. So let's talk about repressed memories because you bring that up as well. So what we see is it, during the hallucinations with Alex in her mind palace, as you say, that she starts to see the true story. And we see the the two versions kind of going side by side. We see the version that she remembers and you see this emerging true story that starts to come out. In the uh, version that she remembers, it's this rosy colored, rose colored glasses version. And then she remembers a more difficult version in which her and the, particularly the father were the villains. And presumably she starts to realize this because her life is falling apart. That's, that's what, you know, as her life begins to fall apart and she becomes more and more stressed she starts to, without any outside influence, no one's telling her, uh, maybe her brother, I guess, is, is confronting her with things. She starts to actually confront the truth. And so, is this accurate? Well, it is sort of. We do suppress, we do repress traumatic memories, but I did a whole episode on this, if you want to listen to it a few years ago, called Repressed Memories. And there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Uh, I'll give three different conceptions that people have. Uh, the first two are, in my view, wrong, and this, and the third one is right. The first one is that this old psychoanalytic idea that traumatic memories or I don't know, difficult memories are completely repressed into the unconscious and the person has no access to it. That doesn't usually happen. It can. We can dissociate, but it's not usually what happens. It's not what we're talking about when it comes to what Berto was talking about or what Cassie went through in, in The Flight Attendant. The second version is that people will say that repressed memories is a falsehood. There's no scientific, scientific evidence of it. When people, because there was this whole thing in the 80s when the satanic panic came out, when there was this uh, California case where all these kids at this daycare were thought that they might have been sexually abused by the daycare owners. Do you remember hearing about this, Berto? Yes, that sounds very familiar. Yeah, the, yeah, I don't know all the details off the top of my head, but there was this uh, daycare center and they thought maybe some of the kids were abused and they brought in all the kids, several kids, in to be questioned and they brought in a specialist, a therapist, who had, I believe, no training in interrogation. <laughs> or anything. And Great. she, through interviews, at the end of the interviews, the children would stand on stage and say, you know, on the stand in court and say, yes, that person over there did this to me, they put this in my body, they asked me to do that, they did that to me. And Jeez. the the world was aghast because they're thinking, well, a four-year-old, a six-year-old isn't going to say that unless it happened because kids don't know about that sort of thing. So how in the world did it not happen? Something happened. And if you have several children saying this, and and they were, con I believe they were convicted and blah, blah, blah. And then we went back and looked at the case uh, years later, and I think a lot of the children actually came forward later and said, no, 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 none of those things happened to me. Oh. Basi basically what happened, what, and I, I don't know if I have this exactly right, but 
uh, I know that this happens sometimes. I don't know if it was this case, but what happens is if you have someone who either inadvertently or purposely interviews someone with the purpose of putting ideas in someone's heads, memories into particularly young children, you can make people think or remember anything. If you say, Incepting. <laughs> yeah, you basically are just like, did they touch you somewhere? And the kid's like, no. And you say, are you sure? And there's this command that is yeah. being felt by the kid of like, well, I think I'm supposed to say yes. And the kid says, yes. And you're like, oh, okay. Where did they touch you? I don't know. Are you sure you don't remember? Well, I don't know. Did they touch you yeah. here? And they point to a doll in the crotch and the kid says, yes. And you're like, okay, let's move yeah. on. Did, what did they do to you? I don't know. Did they put something inside of you? Yes. Okay, and yeah. then you, you just keep doing that. And then a week later, you ask the kid, what did Jane do to you? And the kid will tell a whole story. And you yeah. say, are you lying? And the kid will go, nope, I'm telling the truth. That's what happened. He did this to me. He put this in me and he did that and he did that. And, it, and, you, and when you hear that story from the kid at that point, you don't see how they progress to that state. You think, oh, well, this kid must be telling the truth. And yeah. then what happened uh, was people and and you can actually do this to older people as well and the idea is is like oh it's repressed memories you know people will say oh you didn't know that you had this happen to you and, and it was traumatic and so you repressed it but then it became debunked as this technique of brainwashing people into thinking <laughs> that things happen when and so this whole idea of repressed memories is a complete falsehood okay that is also false in that it is true that those memories were planted but the idea of repression is not uh, th we don't throw that out <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in the process. That, so the third perspective, which is uh, held by me and others, is that there are memories. So let's just take you, Berto, for example. When we ask you, when you first go to therapy, tell us about your childhood. You would tell the story of all the good parts. And we'd say, well, did anything bad happen? You'd be like, no, not really. Are you sure? Mm, no. I mean, it, you know, it was good. I, you know, I had a really great time. And then as you go through therapy, you start going, well, wait, I guess this did happen. In my head, I kind of framed it as an innocuous thing, or I wasn't really focusing on it when I really thought about it. Now that I think about it a bit more, now that I talk about it, and I maybe I ask a few people about what happened, I'm starting to piece together this bigger story that like, wait, I was abandoned at the age of four. <laughs> I witnessed yeah. my parents being violent together. So you don't call that a repressed memory. You just call it a frame of your memory or a focus on particular memories or a, a, a lack of clarification on memories because you were never allowed to talk about it until you're an adult, that sort of thing. Right, Berto? Absolutely. I mean, and I think that's where you're getting, because like, that's how they showed them in the show. It wasn't like, there was no birthday party. I don't, wait a minute, there was a birthday. It was more like, the birthday party was fine. We were all laughing and stuff. I, I sure he pushed you, but wait, I don't know. Like, was that? I mean, they exaggerate a little bit because they have to show the scenes and of course, but I feel that even, you don't even have to go into memories from your past. That was how my uh, therapy started with stuff that was happening to me in the moment. Because I've told this story before. I walk in, very first session, I, as we're talking, I'm rubbing my eyes and my eyes, I'm just rubbing my eyes every like few seconds. And my therapist goes, Hey, what, what's going on with your eyes? I go, Oh, nothing, nothing. It's, it's fine. But we keep going. And then she's like, Oh, I, I got to ask you, like you, you keep touching your eyes. Is, are they irritated? I go, yeah, it's just my, I, I wear contacts and I'm on my last pair and I really need to get them changed. It's, they're irritated. Oh, how come you don't change them? Well, it's my last pair. I need to go get more. It, but it's not, it's not a big deal. Oh, but um, like, why don't you go get more? And I'm getting irritated inside. I'm like, why are we talking about this? This is not anything. It's just my contact. And then as, as she keeps digging, I'm like, well, I've just been too busy. I've been too busy. I, I haven't had a chance to go. And we get to this point where, where it's obvious that I'm not being present for my own body and my own needs enough to just go and simply order the new pack of contact lenses. Instead, I'm suffering, putting myself at the edge of conjunctivitis because 
I'm not paying attention to my pressing in my body. But I had no clue that that's what was happening. And that's not a memory from 30 years ago, 50 years ago. That is in the moment, let alone when you rewind the clock. And you're like, no, it was fine that my grandparents, my mom's mom dropped off a, a black hefty garbage bag full of toys for Christmas. That was fine. Oh, well, that's, that's great that that was fine. Well, yeah, what kid doesn't want a, a bag full of toys? You know, years later, I wrote a song called Bag Full of Toys, How Obscene. And it was like all about framing. Like, why am I getting... Right, that's interesting. That, 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 it's very similar to what was depicted in the TV show. You look back at be- the beginning of this process and you're like, yeah, I had a bag full of toys. It was so awesome. Yeah. I got this, I got that. I still have that. I wish I no, had I that. No, I can't remember a single thing that was in that bag. Oh, really? Well, at any Not rate, you, you had a nice memory. Like, I remember the bag full of toys. Yeah. But then you clarify it and perhaps get access to memories that are there and are waiting to be kind of clarified or reflected on in a more accurate way. And you have a completely different memory of that situation. Yeah. Now, do we call that <laughs> repressed memories? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in my language, we do. It's a repression or an alteration of the, of the memory for a defensive purpose. You're trying to defend against the difficulty of having to admit that. Because if you admit that, particularly when you're young, it's very, it's very challenging. It's very threatening to apply it to Cassie as she is coding the memories with her father. She has a choice. She can either see it for the reality. And if she sees it for the reality, she has to realize that her father is a monster and that the, and that means she has to either move away from him or just not feel very good about being close to him. And that would be terrible. Or if she can decide to code the memories and frame the memories as a positive experience and really try to shoehorn it into a positive memory. And through that, she gets to retain her relationship and her attachment with her father, which is preferable, especially when you're alone and you don't have anyone else to turn to. Because I think the mom and the son had their own alliance against the father and daughter. And so she retains the attachment, but has, but all she has to do is alter the memory. That's a lot easier to deal with. It's a lot easier to deal with altering or repressing a memory than yeah. it is to completely be on your own and realize that your father is a villain, right? Yep. So, okay, let's talk about the hallucinations, the, the, the psychology of the hallucinations here. So you, you talked about a mind palace. What else did we see regarding or specifically around the hallucinations, Bruno? So I didn't know where they were going. I even came this close in the penultimate episode to thinking, wait, is this whole thing about someone who is a complete alcoholic who is actually having like delirium tremens or something? Like basically they are actually imagining all of this. It, and so like this moment in AA, like I thought when she goes to AA and it was actually just to kind of escape, I was like, wait, is there a big reveal coming that this is an intervention, not like the murder didn't happen. Like oh. I was really, really getting there because they made it such a, like no one has these vivid, vivid, full 3D experiences unless you're actually having full hallucinations. And that's how they were presenting them. They weren't just presenting it as like, she's kind of remembering. She was having these full, full conversations with the dead guy uh, she even started kissing him towards the end. Like she was having a, a full experience in, in the, with the dead guy and the dead guy's hotel. Right. And, and in his wh- apartment. Right. What other hallucinations did, did um, she, do, she do was, you remember? They were kind of brief, but. Well, so she kept seeing the flashes of the hunting with her dad. But that wasn't a hallucination. She wasn't. It was more like a memory. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's the way it was depicted. The, the way they depicted clearly with the Alex and going back to that hotel room, she was absolutely hallucinating. The way they depicted it, she checked out. I mean, people yeah. were like, what's going on? What's wrong on? with your eyes? Where yeah. are you? And, yeah. and, and she'd be like, oh. So she would, all of her senses, her hearing, yeah. her, her, her vision, her touch, everything was transported to this other place. And she yeah. was having full on conversations in her head with another person. And so that's a complete hallucination in, in a very comprehensive way. What other 
Well, I'll just tell you because yeah, I don't remember the other ones. <laughs> the, the other one was a uh, when the bug moves in the picture. Oh, right, the mantis, the praying yeah. mantis. And the other is actually she starts to see Alex in the real world instead of That's not true, just yeah. the, at the uh, AA meeting. Yeah, and then she also starts to see her herself from the outside in the interrogation scene. She can actually, v you know, yep. see herself being interrogated. So all these are very different kinds of hallucinations, and they were uncontrollable, and she seemingly had never hallucinated before. The way she reacted to the first couple times it happened, she was just like, you know, what's happening to right. me? Okay, so what disorder does this seem to portray, Berto? What do you think? Uh, dissociation? No. Psychosis? Uh, yeah, psychosis, uh, right. So it's a psychotic episode, uh, or the hallucination episode, typical to schizophrenia or bipolar with psychosis, depression with psychosis, drug-induced psychosis, this sort of thing. Is it accurate, Berto? What do you think? I don't know. Uh, what can I'm going to say... that real? I I'm going to say it is sort of. So you can hallucinate people, but not entire rooms. I've never heard of a case or read about a case where someone hallucinated the way that she did. The typical way is like you would... The way that she d did at the AA meeting, she's in reality at an AA meeting. This is before she decides to become sober. She's with Miranda, right? And all of a sudden, Alex is talking to her, just, uh, or she sees a bunch of Alex's instead of the real people. So she can see the real chair. She can see the real room. She might even hear real things, but she sees other things in the midst of the her visual field. That's typical to schizophrenia or mania you will impose 3d fully fledged believable objects in the real world that's that's the typical way but we don't usually completely check out from reality but it can happen mm. in severe cases but it would be in the middle of high symptoms like completely generally a break from reality and then you skip town and completely go to this other place but she would just be completely functional and then boom for like a minute she'd be in this other room talking to this person and that that's that's yeah. pretty inaccurate and it's tricky because like normally your brain can't reconstruct to that level of detail that much stuff right uh, so obviously they're filming for a show and things like that but in dreams you you can't you you can't actually construct that much reality in your brain <laughs> right yeah, it's the way you can tell if you're dreaming actually is pick up a book and try to read it because right. your brain can't print things on a page and also read it off of the page at the same time. Except when I've done stuff like that in my dreams, there's always some explanation. Like, you oh, know, my, like, my, I can't focus my I, eyes. Why are my eyes like, oh, it's so yeah. annoying. <laughs> like, why can't I punch? And then I'm like, am I in a dream? Oh, no, it's because I just got to put more body into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the bug picture would be an accurate hallucination because that was, again, she's in the real world. Yeah. She's looking at it. She's stressed out. She's looking at a picture and all of a sudden it starts to talk to her. That could absolutely happen. Also seeing Alex in the real world. Um, it also is accurate that it can be exacerbated by drinking or lack of sleep or stress or trauma, going through the murder, seeing the dead body. Could absolutely, all those things, could, uh, particularly the drinking and lack of sleep and stress can increase hallucinations of people, or maybe even emer have em emerge in people who it wouldn't have otherwise. But usually this means if this is happening, usually what it means is that you have an emerging mental disorder. You have, yeah. you're, you're beginning, you're in the beginning stages of bipolar or schizophrenia. But, you know, there's a, there's, I could see this happening. It's not entirely out of the uh, possibility. And also they were very distressing to her, which was also accurate. She um, would often, especially in the beginning, just be, oh my God, what's happening? It was, you know, so, um, so I would say that it was sort of accurate. Um, okay, so let's talk about alcohol abuse. That's another psychological thing. So what did we see in terms of alcohol abuse, Bruno? I think they said it best. In one scene towards the end, they were like, how are you still alive? <laughs> someone asks her um and that's how i felt often throughout the show i was like oh my gosh you are how are you doing this she would down like a whole bottle of vodka 
she was just like constantly downing vodka, constantly. Yeah, it was un- unbelievable. It, it, and so I, they depicted it well and painfully. Yeah. Right. We see lots and lots of drinking and that shows that someone has a tolerance for it and a need for it. She used it to numb out when she would have traumatic feelings, which was very accurate. Uh, She made excuses about her drinking. She made bad decisions. She would sometimes sneak alcohol drinks. She wanted to find drinking buddies. She needed a lot to get drunk. She drank in the morning and she started very young. Okay, so is this ac- was it an accurate depiction of alcohol abuse, Berto? What do you think? Uh, from what I've seen, and I'm certainly no expert, but I've, I, I think there's different kinds of alcohol abuse. Uh, I've abused alcohol when I was younger, and my abuse pattern was really um, social, and it was, it, it was triggered by if I was dealing with things in my mind and I wasn't really aware of it. There were times where I could just go too far um, and drink to complete excess. Um, and that's totally unhealthy. And I would do very dangerous stuff when I was, when I was drunk like that. Um, but I, I never, you know, I never drank at home or in the morning or things. I do know of other cases where it is actually not social drinking or it might've started as social drinking, but where it developed into just drinking and just drinking by yourself and drinking chronically till you're nearly dead. Yeah. Um, so I think it varies. Yeah. So the depiction in the flight attendant is sort of accurate. It leaves out some, in all the reasons we said there, there were, she was drinking a lot. There was a tolerance. She, had some consequences, like she got arrested with Buckley once where they were on a bender and they got that um, horse and broke something. And yeah, so that was, that was, you know, pretty uh, common or, or not common, but a, a good, ex- good depiction of what it's, what it's like for someone to be intoxicated chronically. But it, it leaves out the common consequences. I mean, yeah. That this, when people told me about this show, they're like, oh, it's about this alcoholic flight attendant. And I was like, oh. But pretty quickly I thought, wait, she's, she's, she's having a great time. I mean, if you just watch this show, you'd be like, I want to have her life. I mean, she had all the fun. She went to the party. She went clubbing. She, the glamour and the sex. And occasionally they would kind of show her a little hungover, but only like a little bit in the morning. And that was it. Like they didn't really show a lot of negative consequences to her drinking. If anything, I would call this a show about a partier who is a flight attendant. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so first off that first episode, and certainly I totally agree. I had not heard anything about this show when you said, Hey, watch this. Cause we'll podcast about it. Hadn't heard anything. So I had no understanding that it was about an alcoholic or anything. So that first episode, for sure, the first part of it, I was just thinking, oh, okay. So she's like a jet-setting flight attendant who, by definition, and who like goes and parties hard. But here's the catch. I think as a society, we've convinced ourselves that drinking to excess is, is cool and okay as long as you kind of like show up at work the next day. Right. She shows uh, up at work then, or, you know, there were some times right. when she'd be a little late, but she'd make it, you know, she'd, right. she'd retain but, her job, that kind of thing. But first of all, not even speaking about the health, the, the health hazard here that she was incurring on her body, but really they, they do start showing us the toll that it's taking on her relationships pretty early on. Yeah, but not to the extent. So let me tell you in reality. Well, no, no. It, so so I, I think I know where you're going. But, and I'll let you get there. But I'm saying, like, we also don't know at what stage we, we jumped into the story. Yeah. Hey, Deserving listeners, as you know, I'm constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. One of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp.com. So if you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to BetterHelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the slash Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it helps us out. I get a lot of emails from you saying that you're looking for a therapist, 
As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, but I know it can be really hard to find a good one to work with. Like I said, one of the options available to try is betterhelp.com slash Kirk. And you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide, which is amazing. I've been told that you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message with your counselor anytime. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. And I've been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month of therapy today. All right, we're back from the break. So if Alex were talking to Cassie, trying to convince her to become a patron of the podcast, what would he sound like? Is Alex the guy that got killed? Yeah. Right? Oh. I think that's his name. Yeah. Um, hey, Cassie. Um, so while you're there, no, I know. I know my throat is slit and stuff, but listen, calm down. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. Uh, while you're there, I wanted to tell you about something. You know how you're getting a little irritated that you're in my little hotel room and... I, Wait, why are, you, why are you leaving? Like, we're just having a conversation here. What, you're squeamish about blood? Look, let's clean up the blood. There, no blood. Now, while you're doing this, why don't you try to get some mental help for yourself? Like, so the best way to do it is to uh, maybe listen to a podcast that talks about these kinds of issues. It's the Psychology in Seattle podcast. And you can imagine yourself in the Psychology in Seattle podcast castle, your mind castle. And there you can listen to all the little episodes. I'll be there with you. We'll listen together. We'll like look at all the praying mantises coming to life. It'll be wonderful. Rotten Tomatoes, Birdo. What do you think? Uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, this is the, the um, critics score? Yeah. Critics gave it a 85. 98. What? 98? Yeah, it seems a little... Uh -huh. I think TV shows tend to get... Higher ratings what? on Rotten Tomatoes? That's bizarre. Audience score? Well, 90. 68. 68? Yeah. Well, that's surprising. Yeah. And you gave it an 8 and I gave it a... So I'm going to I'm gonna you give it a 6? I gave it a 6. So you average wow. this out. That's about a 68. Whoa. Why am I so off on this? Yeah. I mean, I gave it an 8 because I, I thought it was a, a predictable but thoroughly enjoyable show. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get into how I thought it was like a seven or eight in the beginning. Nominated for two Golden Globes, Best Television Series, and Best Actress for Kaylee Cuoco. Based on a book, The Flight Attendant by Chris Bojalian, an Armenian-American novelist. Okay, let's talk about what we, what we liked. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit so far, but Berto, what, what did you like about this? Okay, so I like the style. <laughs> it was a little reminiscent of 24. Uh, in that it kept me, not only did they do the side-by-sides, but it kept me on the edge of my seat. Like, I want more. I want, I want more. Uh, I think they were inspired by that. Um, I also really love the intro sequence. Like, I, I actually, I want a whole show in that style, the yeah. intro sequence style. Yeah. Um, but, so character-wise, I wasn't a big fan of all the characters, but I really liked her. I liked Alex. I liked uh, Rosie. Um, and I, I enjoyed the, um, the bad guy, uh, FBI, uh, FBI, N bad guy as in like the guy that really wanted to nail her yeah, for Van, some reason, Van I actually w really enjoyed his character because you don't see, yeah, like you don't see FBI agents like that, that often where he's like competent, but kind of a dick, but he's only doing his job. Like he really suspects her. So why not yeah. go after her? Um, and the interplay between him and the and the the, the other gal, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I definitely liked the backstory of her and her dad and the drinking and the son, the the brother. I liked how that developed. I, I didn't know if they were going to be able to pay it off. I felt they paid it off. I loved the climax scene with that whole thing. Um, so and and I definitely loved. Look, I thought that it was predictable. The, the first episode was definitely not predictable. I did not expect her to wake up with the, the guy dead next to her. I thought that was cool. But after that, I thought that, look, I, I, th I, I was pretty sure that, um, that the, the gal that was after her wasn't the real killer. I was pretty sure that the guy that she was going to the clubs with was 
either the killer or definitely involved with the bad guys. So like I saw a lot of these things coming, but I still really enjoyed it. And I even the sort of maybe cheesy moments where her other flight attendant guy jumps in, it turns out he's CIA with a gun because they had pre they had told us that earlier. They said, you know, a lot of flight attendants end up being CIA agents because of all the traveling. And I knew I was like, okay, one of them is a CIA agent. Um, so I found it to be a funny, enjoyable show with lots of little twists and turns. And even though it was a little predictable, I, I still loved it. Yeah, interesting. I, I share a lot of your sentiments, but have some different ones. So for me, I really like the first half. I would give it a seven or eight. It's fun, interesting, good writing, uh, good relationship. I loved, you didn't mention Annie played by Zosha Mamet. Uh, from girls. Oh, is Annie the um, the, the lawyer, lawyer best friend? friend? Yeah, yeah, she was great. She was great. Yeah, I loved her. I thought yeah. I, I never watched girls, so I, I was I just kept saying to my wife, I was like, oh my god, that actress is so funny and amazing and believable. <laughs> and Stacey's like, after a while, she's like, yeah, you know, she's from Girls, right? I was like, oh, I never watched that really. <laughs> All I know, I think I only see on YouTube will see an occasional uh, scene with Adam Driver, and I find those to be delight delightful. But anyway, the relationship between Annie and, and Cassie, I thought was just perfectly written, perfectly executed. Kaylee Cuoco from Big Bane Theory did an amazing job, a perfect balance between fun and dramatic. Uh, and she's also the executive producer too. So, you know, essentially she's the one that said a while ago, years ago, she, that she wanted to, you know, option this book and put it all together. So, wow. you know, hats off to her for putting this whole thing together. And for the, the relationship between Annie Cassie, the acting for Kaylee Cuoco and Zosha Mamet, just, just amazing. And like you said, the story about her father and her brother was perfectly executed. They laid it out very well and very believable. Uh, there's a lot of depictions like this where I'm like, okay, I think this is going a little far, but very uh, believable, very well depicted, powerful story, and maybe something that can help people who have similar experiences be able to validate them. I also really like the interaction between the two agents, Agent Hammond and yeah. Agent White. And I loved the anti-racist and feminist components of the show that were, uh, I don't believe shoehorned in. I, I think they were purposeful, but there was that scene where at the beginning where uh, Agent Kim Hammond just tells him off and just is like, because uh, he says something like, well, you know, maybe you should yeah, think about the, the same fact, level. <laughs> yeah, we're at the same level and you're a lot older than me. And she's like, okay. And she just lays out the best uh, speech to him and just reduces him down to nothing in this yeah. beautiful, well-spoken way. Uh, and there were a number of moments like that where she's like, back up, don't sit on my desk. Like all this stuff around male entitlement and white entitlement. And she just stood up to him and said, nope, that's not going to happen. And it was very satisfying to watch. There were other moments too, like, Miranda's on the plane going to Rome and the guy's like, hey, lady, how's it going? She's like, well, I, I, I'm I, on my way to save someone from being murdered. I was thought I was going to kill her, but, <laughs> uh, and I have, you know, I have a bullet wound in my leg. And he's just like, huh? And she just raises the window. And there was just a lot of moments like that where it was clear they were trying to say, look what women have to deal with. And look at these awesome, strong women just dealing with it in a, this really powerful, intelligent way. I, I just thought there were a lot of moments like that that I, 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 I really I forgot liked. to say, I loved Miranda. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that character and that actress. I just loved how she played that. Yeah. I also really liked the device of having her interact with Alex in her head. They never strayed really from the premise. They never, they never get, I was worried they were going to give him special powers or something like <laughs> he was going to be able to see into her mind or, you know, they, they just, they really stuck with the premise that he was a figment of her imagination yep. and he didn't have any special powers in the same way that she doesn't have any mental special powers. I thought that they would try to make it into this supernatural thing. They never did, which which I really appreciated. Okay, so let me get into things I didn't like. There were a lot more things I didn't like. Again, I gave it a six. And I will say, if you haven't watched it, 
like that. It is definitely worth watching. It's a fun show. Of all the shows that are on TV right now, I would say it's, you know, definitely in the top three or four percent for sure. I mean, when we're talking about all the CSIs and all the uh, the other kind of silly shows that are out there, I mean, this this definitely isn't the cream of the crop. But of the things that I see, I, you know, I, I'm just going to... I'm particularly the last half i was just like oh okay i'm getting and stacy was too the two of i in between episodes we'd take the dogs for a walk and i'd be like yeah i'm feeling a little bored with it <laughs> now like as it the first four episodes completely gripped and then the last part i was like this is just getting out of control and i feel like it, it was a a victim of its own writing i think where okay so you talked about like the coincidences of the the CIA agent. So let me just, and, and when, is, when it was happening, I, especially in the last episode, I was like, come on. Now I know this is supposed to be a fantastical romp of an adventure, but still, it really stretches the, the ability of credulity here. So you have four flight attendants. One was involved, Cassie is involved in a massive murder of a man connected to some sort of mob, essentially. Uh, and an international weapons dealing mob. Okay. So Cassie's involved in that. The second flight attendant, Megan is a North Korean spy. And the third is a CIA agent. Now I understand the second and the third are related, but then we also go to her best friend is a lawyer for other mobsters who actually kills someone in the span of the TV show. And number five, her best friend's boyfriend is the most expert computer hacker that one has ever seen in a movie. <laughs> so <laughs> these, it's like, uh, come on. And the it's thing is, fun. <laughs> the thing is you didn't, okay, and I'll get to more later in terms of too many storylines and characters, but I, I just thought, oh, come on. Because the main story, okay, let me get into that actually while I'm on the topic. So there are too many stories and too many characters that are made central in this in this movie. It's like they had four... It's a TV show, and this was only the first season. Keep that in mind. I am not going to watch the second season. I can't imagine that the second Dude, season... now Rosie's on the run, man. Are you kidding me? Yeah, the least exciting part of this story. I mean, it was... So, the main story is great. Cassie trying to exonerate herself. It's a good story. There's a lot of s suspense. You got Alex. You have her childhood. You have the brother. You have the FBI agents. You have Miranda. You have Victor. You have Buckley. That is a well-packaged story. Then, completely unrelated, is another story with Megan and her husband, her son, in North Korea. I, and Stacy kept asking me, my wife, she's like, so I don't get it. Is this related to Cassie's story? And I was like, well, maybe the North Korean mob or the North Koreans are involved in the sale of the weapons or something, you know, it, it, that must fold in at some point. But it never did. And it was boring. Because she's the flight attendant. So I actually, I mean, I hear you. I, I, I took a different route with it because I thought, you know what's funny? When, it, when the first couple episodes, what, what happens is I thought, nah, I see what's happening. Her buddy, Rosie, is the one that killed uh, Alex. I know. I She's, thought that too. Right? I mean, that's how they were making it seem. Yeah. But then I realized, you know, then when you start seeing like, wait a minute, what's actually happening? It's like, see, hers is the more believable story, ironically. I mean, maybe not to the extent they did it, but it was like, she's this flight attendant. She's been in the business forever. She's got dreams. She wants to make money for her family. And her husband works at some tech company. And so she's approached by some dude to see if she like will steal some stuff. She has no idea. She's completely used. Um, and, and I kept thinking that I was like, wait a minute, maybe this is all related. And I'm like, and then when it became clear, like towards the sixth episode, I'm like, these storylines aren't related. I'm like why, what's going on? Then I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. This is the flight attendant. This is not about one flight attendant. This is about the flight attendant. Yeah, it's just and a, but a boring all distraction. All little stories. Yeah, it's and, a... and, and then I realized, oh, well, now I know what they're going to do in the next season, right? Because, like, now they're both going to be CIA, and then she's going to be on the run, and, you know, what else? Because they're not, and then the, the big wealthy family is still on the loose, right? They only killed that one dude. Yeah. I would have completely uh, had a different opinion about it if 
I wasn't bored okay. at the end. And that's totally fair. I was not bored for whatever reason. But I could see if you're bored, you're bored. Yeah. The other uh, thing I... this is These are small kind of nitpicks is... Can Hollywood just stop making CG animals? Because it's obvious when they do. The rabbits, <laughs> the rabbits were so clearly bad CG, right? Did you notice I didn't that? Think of, I did not notice. Either just get a real rabbit and deal with the fact that you have to edit around the fact that it's a real rabbit and don't show it actually doing exact... Because, you know, I can just see them writing. They're like, okay, I want a rabbit and I want it to look at me while I am getting out of the car and then I need it to turn away from me and hop away. And someone's saying, you know, that's real expensive to get a real rabbit to do that. That's going to be... But for like 5% the cost, we can just hire some nerd with a computer and they'll, they'll animate that. And they're like, okay, go ahead. And every time that they put it in movie, it, it takes me out of it. The other thing is, is um, and this is more for my wife uh, in terms of her negative, was that there's a lot of gore in this. Yes. <laughs> uh, that was not necessary. Like, yeah, we needed to know that he was murdered, but did we need to see his, his, the inside flesh of his neck and like <laughs> that much blood, right? Like, like we really focused, there were like close up shots of, of his neck uh, flesh, like spilling out of his skin, you know? So I, you're right. I could see that. I, I did take it as, um, because they were constantly making this connection to what was, I'm sure also traumatizing, which was her going to shoot that deer, seeing the blood like her, the fact that she took that life, seeing the dead animal, and then just briefly after that, seeing the blood of her dad a and walking away from that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so I think that there was this it's connection a, to like the trauma of that blood. Yeah. The blood was fine, but the inside of his neck, like we, it was gross, you know? And, <laughs> and I'm... I'm okay with it. You're probably really okay with that kind Your of... Your anatomy shaming. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife is... She can't even watch. She's like... Yeah. She won't even look at the screen. She's like, oh my God. You know, That's and so it, funny. I barely noticed that stuff. <laughs> and, I, and I think like, uh, why? You know, why? Again, this show is... It's not a horror movie, right? It's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, the other nitpick I'll say is that the beer cans in, in movies and TV, they always pick a beer that is obviously a made-up Hollywood beer for movies. And I'm always like, so you can drive around in Chevrolets and Hondas and Toyotas and Priuses, and you can wear designer clothes, you can wear Nikes, but you can't have a beer like a Budweiser or a Miller or a Coors. Hmm. Like, is it not possible to have a real uh, beverage? It's too, too risky, man. Unless I don't get it. You know what yeah, I mean? Unless they like, got a contract signed. Um, this now the was vod, always heartbreaking the, with with Grand Theft Auto is because they used to not be able to have real brands. Yeah, the the vodka was believable because there's so many different kinds of off brand sure. vodka. Yeah. You know, it's, it just yeah. I was like, oh, that kind of looks like a vodka label. But the <laughs> beer, it's just it, it doesn't even resemble anything. It was like green with like this yeah, right? weird gold. I was like, I is, thought, it, is I that like that a too. like a Vietnam beer or something? Like, <laughs> I thought that too. I, I remembered your your glitch with this because I was like, yeah, I could see why this bugs Kirk. <laughs> you know, it uh, takes you out of the movie. You know, it's like when they go, it, my yeah. number is five 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 five. five. Do you remember? Uh, or sorry, ha have you seen season three of Cobra Kai? Uh, so that's another show that I just, I, I loved season one and two, just adore it. And then same, me and my wife got about three or four episodes in and we're just kind of like, ugh. It's in just, season three? Yeah. It's just Oh, not, I'm enjoying it. But, but the main thing is that the brand is Doyona instead of Toyota. Oh. The, the, the big Japanese car company is Doyona. <laughs> God. I mean, I just don't. Is it is it that hard to get a real brand on some? I just yeah, thought, yeah, it's it's hard, especially I, if it's going to feature prominently. They either have to fully, because um, you know it's a lit litigious uh, society. With it. but let me ask you a question, Berto. As soon as this happened in the in the show, I was like, I got to ask Berto about this. What was that fob thing with the password that they found in Alex's condo? What in the world was that? Oh, so you know, sometimes you can set up. Um, two or three factor authentication for accounts. And so 
uh, you know, obviously we're familiar with entering a password and you're familiar with like, sometimes you get a code on your phone and you have to like type in the code, you know? Yeah. But Pe- people but some- call me randomly sometimes or just like, so can you tell us the code and I give them the code? That's what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, exactly. Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but then sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes you need an actual hardware device. Um, oftentimes they're USB, you just plug it in and it's got, a an encrypted key that only you have, and you have it literally on that device. And if you don't have that, you can't unlock. So, for example, uh, at my work in um, astrology, my computer, I can't unlock it without touching my finger to a little fob that's put in the USB port of the computer. Like a finger... Uh, yeah, I have to touch the side. Fingerprint. Because, like, we, we have a lot of predictions based on the position of planets and things like this. And if you like close your eyes and you use your ninth eye, you can really see it. And we don't want that, those secrets to get out. So we encrypt it all on the laptop. And the only way to get in is to touch the side of the fob. Interesting. Yeah, I did. I was, I mean, I feel like I know a fair amount about computers. And I was like, what are they looking for? I don't even understand. Yeah. Uh, my last uh, complaint is HBO Max. The UI is terrible. Did you find that to be true? <laughs> uh, <we're, laughs> that's a funny one. I mean, so many of those apps upset me because they also change the UI a lot. And that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.